um, I've seen some of her photos we had them on display here during the last um, show, uh, show and sale that we had last fall. Gorgeous, gorgeous photos. Um, but I admire her who has a stock of gorgeous photos that she could have brought in and done it the easy way. She brought in her plants themselves, some of them even in flower, um, so that we could actually see them up close and see all the beautiful variations of color and shading and leaf shape. Um, I'm always interested in what gets people started um, doing their collection, you know, collecting cacti and succulents. And Gary says a very formative experience for her was as a child. Her parents would take she and her sisters um, into the Boston Flower Show every year. And um, was that back in the Commonwealth Armory? Days? Yes, yeah. that was the first one I remember. Yep. Yeah, and um, and she said she was so envious of the other, the young people that she, who could exhibit in the junior category. Um, so that apparently inspired her passion to do this. And she did, you did, you said you, your first um, exhibit at the flower show was in your 20s, right? So she's been doing this a long time, obviously with, um, with great um, passion and intelligence. And um, she knows a lot about them. And since I am, I passed the stage where it grows a leaf and it loses a leaf, but I still have a lot to learn about um, cultivating echeveria. So I'm glad to welcome Patty Perry Waterman today. Okay. Oh, and I just remember, this isn't all she does. She also does aloes and agaves. Um, and um, yes, and Gasterius, which my she favorites. says are her favorites. Yeah. So she has um, a lot of, of extensive <laughs> broad knowledge as well as these. And maybe we'll get you back to talk to us about these other things. Yes, thank you. Thank Dave. you. Okay, I guess I, I am on the mic. And you guys can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah. Is that oh, too loud? Or? Does this, oh, so let me shut this off. All right. Then if I move over here. I think this is the first time I've talked on a mic. So, all right. Thank you. Um, I'm a little nervous to speak to you guys because you, I usually talk to people who don't know as much as I do. <laughs> so I can get away with some fuzzy stuff. So, <laughs> so please, if you hear some, I say something and you don't agree, <laughs> raise your hand and, and uh, clue, us, clue me in. Um, but I'll do my best. I have grown these for a while now. Um, I, how did I get involved with Echeveria? I do, I do like a lot of other succulent plants. I think, like most people, I think they're really attractive and appealing. Um, they're pretty. Uh, they don't need flowers, although they do have flowers, and they just are, to me, very attractive species. Oh, someone like that. Um, and luckily for me right now, they're very popular at weddings, <laughs> so there's a lot of them for sale in various places. I think you probably you may have gone to a wedding where there's echeverias all over the table. Um, so you can get them online, eBay, um, Etsy. You guys familiar with Etsy? Yeah, they have a lot of echeverias for sale. They're little micro uh, uh, nurseries out in California that are selling them. And so they're really in the, the, the high art. And uh, they're, not, they're not expensive, even with shipping all the way from California. Um, and the other thing is I do have space in a greenhouse, a private greenhouse in Wellesley. So I'm, Echeveria do need some light in the wintertime, although I must say that I have seen some incredibly beautiful ones that people are growing in sunny windows, so you can still do it. But I'm lucky to have that, so I've, I've uh, just uh, had them for years, so I like them. Um, they're also pretty easy to grow. I don't think they're tricky. They're definitely not a tricky one. There are some species that are tricky to grow, and I've killed a lot of them, but, um, and so they're not here right now. But uh, I've brought the ones that I think are pretty good. Um, a couple of books that I like, um, Fred Dordit's book. You probably are familiar with this book. This is great. He goes through, this is about all the succulents in general, but he does have a great chapter on Echeveria. And I like the way he's, he's um, described them. Um, and you know, he has the rapidly offsetting Echeverias, the colorful medium-sized ones, the clumping forms, but the, just the way he has it describes the different types of them. The other book that's great, um, it was published in 2005, so of course half the, the cultivars that are available now aren't even in here, but it's a great book. Uh, this is a couple of people, I think, from the, that live in Australia. Um, and it's just a wonderful book about prop, how to, you know, and it gets a lot of information about the older cultivars and also how to propagate them and, and grow them well. The other place that's great, of course, is the internet, where you, nowadays you can see, find some incredible information. Um, and the, um, there's a, two of them that I particularly like, uh, the Botanical Database for Crassulaceae, 
Um, that's crassylacy.com. You can just you can just Google these. And if anybody wants these email, you know, doesn't want to be scribbling this down, just contact me afterwards, and I'll give you the websites. Um, that the one I just the crassylacy.com um, has a lot of habitat pictures for the species. It has news. It's written by um, botanist and biologist, Mexican botanist and biologist. So it's very scientific but easy to, to grasp and, and read and read about. They also have some great cu cultivation tips. And the other website that's just terrific is the International Crassulaceae Network, and that covers all the different crassula, and, um, of which, which Echeveria is one. Um, but it goes into all the different hybrid species, the crosses with some of the other soft succulents that we'll get to a little later, and it has all of them and it's up to date, and it's fantastic. I learned a lot the other day when I was going through it again about some of this stuff. So it's just a terrific, you don't need a book, you can go online, it's free, you can get all this information if you get into these plants. Um, so obviously the Crassulaceae family, so this is the family that these are in. There are currently 175 accepted species of Echeveria, I actually did count them on the plant list. Um, and then there's countless interspecific cultivars and intergeneric crosses with the, um, Sedum, Scraptopetalums, and Pachyphyton. So there's a lot of crosses that have been made. Um, and there are still new species that are being um, discovered even, even right now. So um, they're usually in very inhospitable places, up at you know, over 11,000 feet in some of the mountains in the Andes, or they're in wet forests in um, Central America. So that's why they haven't been discovered yet. Echeveria were named for a... Um, a Mexican um, botanical artist, actually he was born in, he was a Basque, Sp Spanish, but moved to Mexico. Um, and I'm not gonna butcher his name, but it was, the, his middle name was Echeveria with two R's, so that's where it came from. And here's his first, this is the first drawing that was ever done of an Echeveria. It's Echeveria Gibiflora, it was done by um, this fellow, who well, I'm not gonna, does anyone speak Spanish here that can <laughs> say it correctly? <laughs> okay, here, you can, you can t tell me what this. So that's his name. Bidoy. What? Uh, Atanasio Echeveria y Guidoy. There you go. Thank you very much. I didn't want to butcher yeah. that. Yeah, so that is the first uh, il botanical illustration, and they, he was, his name with losing one of the R's is what it, was, what it uh, is now called, and that was in 1787. So basically, what does an Echeveria look like? Uh, here's one here. Let's see, let's see that. It's a bit slightly bigger one. It's a rosette of leaves, usually, that grows either from a short stem or a long succulent stem. And uh, we'll talk about, there's one that's got a long succulent stem. And uh, we'll talk about some of them. I happen to not particularly like the ones with the long succulent stems, but uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. They have tubular flowers, um, and they're bell-shaped. So if you're, some, there's so many crosses, a lot of the times, um, some of them are misnamed, obviously they're misnamed when you see them in nurseries. Um, you can look at, if they're flowering, that will give you a hint of what the parentage is, which, which, whether it's with a sedum or a um, pack of, uh, pack of phyton. So the colors are either um, a reddish, or dark reddish orange, uh, yellow, orange, pink, those are the different colors of the flowers. Um, and they emerge from the stalk just slightly below the, the growing tip. So here's one here, so they come up here. Um, and the leaves are either extremely thin, um, the Shavianas are pretty thin, and then, or they're very, very thick. And there's some really thick ones. This is fairly thick, though the crosses are very thick, um, but, uh, and very succulent. Where do they grow? It's, like, it's important to know where things grow because it helps you to grow them yourself. Um, they, they range, most of them do come from Mexico. However, they go all the way south down to the northern part of uh, the, the Western Andes, down to northern Argentina, northern Chile, um, and also the, the, uh, right through Central America. And then the um, farthest north species is found in Texas. It's um, Echeveria strictiflora, which I have killed many, many, many times. I find it very difficult to grow. It grows in the Chihuahuan Desert, which is the largest desert in North America. It's a Texas-Mexico uh, desert. And um, that is the, the farthest north it grows. Most but not all grow in boulders and rocks in the light shade of oak trees and pine trees at high elevations between four and 7,000 feet. So they're a high elevation plant, or an alpine plant a little bit, on steep slopes in partial shade. Um, some grow, the Andeans grow over 11,000 feet up 
high. And most of those are used, uh, part of the ethnobotany of the native peoples in that part of the world, they're used to cure um, eye problems and ear aches. And, this, and if you actually, if you ever want to find those species to grow them, they're always a little more difficult. But if you did want to grow them, um, if you Google the ethnobotany of South America, that's where you'll find nurseries that sell some of these weird plants that you can't get anywhere else. Um, they look a little, the ones in South America look a little like the Dudleys. They have a Dudley over there if you've seen, seen how they grow. Um, and um, many more are just getting discovered. Um, some, particularly in southern, in, the cent in Central America and in uh, northern South America, are, grow as epiphytes, like bromeliads. They grow as bromeliads. They grow on top of logs and rocks. They, some of them are, are short-stemmed, but some are very long-stemmed. Um, and that's kind of cool. You don't find too many of those on the market. Um, but one was brief, uh, one, there's another interesting one, one um, Echeveria muni munisii, which I was just looking at online, uh, is a beautiful stemless one that was found on the side of a volcano recently, and it's critically endangered. Um, but the Mexican um, botanists and, and biologists are always on the lookout for these new species. Um, and then very few are true desert plants. They really are not, some do grow with the agaves and the, and the cacti, but on the whole, they really are more of a high elevation plant. So bright light, excellent drainage, and good air circulation. It's windy in a lot of the places that they grow. So they do like, if you're growing them inside, they do good, like good air circulation. Some of the adaptations that Chaviria have, um, it's, um, in the dry season, their leaves will, will just uh, wither up and come up and, and, um, and cl close the plant to keep it from getting um, uh, desiccated. And I think a lot, and the other thing is a lot of them have a bloom on the leaves. So you'll notice a lot of them have this silvery white bloom on them. And if you grow them indoors in the winter with not enough light, you lose the bloom. If you're growing it in a greenhouse, you keep it pretty, pretty well, but but the more light they have, the more the bloom is there, and that's another um, great adaptation they have. It also beads up water, so um, it's a good way for it to protect the skin on the, the, the uh, skin on the plant. Um, let's see, this uh, species that I particularly like. So um, I am quite fond of the short stemless Echeveria. I get really annoyed with those long ones. I know, I know, I know that's why some of them grow, but I don't like them. So I tend to avoid them, so I do like the, the short stemless ones. Um, this is Lilacina, Echeveria Lilacina. I've got one in the, for the auction later on, but I love this plant. It looks like it would be hard to grow. It's not. It's a great plant. It's just beautiful. You have to watch it. Of course, it has the bloom, so it does have some spotting on it, you'll notice. But I know when I'm growing these, and they're in the greenhouse all winter, I'm very careful about not watering them. But when they go outside, as soon as the rain gets on them, they get their beautiful bloom back. They look terrific, and they, they look, these have been in a greenhouse all winter for it, so they've just come out, so they don't look there 100%, but another month or two, they're just beautiful, blinding white, so that's a great one. Um, Elegans, uh, Echeveria Elegans, little Mexican snowball, I think, is one of the common names for it. This just makes perfect little mounds, very attractive. Um, one of my absolute favorites is the clumping one, and it's miniature, is Echeveria minima. Um, just a terrific, easy to grow plant. Um, and uh, I put a little one over there in the table over there. But these are great. They clump. They're easy to break a piece off. It's about to flower. It's got well, so it's little buds coming. And as you can see, it's kind of fun to pot up in a nice pot. But that's just a great one. Um, uh, Polydonis, Echeveria Polydonis, again, super easy to grow um, and just a great, great plant. Um, and you'll see this. This one you will see it. Home Depot and nurseries and stuff. I think it's because it's such an easy to grow plant, but I highly recommend growing it. It just gradually get bigger and um, doesn't get that long stem. Uh, Purposorum, um, this is actually, this one I think truly is the species. There are lots of selections of them that look a little different. You can see the flowers are different. So this one looks like it's on steroids compared to that one. Um, so I don't know, I think they made selections of bigger ones and this one's even more that way. Um, this, I wouldn't say, was truly purposorum, but who knows. Um, uh, Cindy brought this one. This is Nudulosa, correct? Yep. So this is another one that was just discovered in the 1980s. So that's a pretty one with nice markings on the leaves. Uh, Setosa, the um, furry one, one of the furry Echeverias. Again, really easy to grow and fun flowers. Um, this is another one of the minis. Um, as I've gotten older, I'm getting, liking mini plants more and more and more. It's just easier to move around. Uh, globulosa makes little globs and little arms and 
very easy to grow. I bought this from Arc last year, I think. This is Setosa. This is a, a variety, a miniature variety of Setosa. It's a variety, a minor, right, Art? Did I get this from you? Yes. Just that's a very attractive plant. Um, and then um, Echeveria agavoides, so like an agave, and I have quite a few of them here. This is my favorite, Echeveria, again, just a really, this is the uh, agave, Echeveria, so agavoides, uh, A-G-A-V-O-I-D-E-S. Um, and I'll talk about why these are different from this one in a second, but um, that's just a great species. Um, let's see. Uh, and then you have mutations of, of the species. So one of the most popular mutations is Echeveria runyanii topsy-turvy. You see this one all the time. This one's a great one, too. Very easy to grow. Well-behaved. Has really nice, pretty flowers. Um, uh, this is just great. I don't mind this mutation. There are some, uh, some that have these awful bumps on them that I don't like either. Um, what is it called, Cran uh, cranulation or something like that. Um, and that you'll see those for sale, they're very expensive, but I, I don't think they're very attractive. They, the, the cells have erupted on the surface, so they have, look like they have eruptions on the, and I don't have any because I don't like them. Um, uh, color mutation, so back to the agavioid, the Echeveria agavioides. These are, aga um, it's really interesting. That, this particular species, so that's this one here, <coughs> has many different variations. And the reason is because, um, and this was fascinating, I got this on one of those cool websites, um, it's highly variable in habitat and it occurs in at least eight Mexican states. So it's spread out over a large part of Mexico. And um, it's also the hardiest in, of the Echeverias and can actually take some frost. So I think like this one is, um, Lipstick, it's a selection that someone made. Lipstick, this is ebony, this is a small young plant. This is Romeo, this will turn bright red in the fall. And this is, uh, I think this is just the regular species. I've had this one for years. Um, so these are much more expensive if you're buying them. Um, but if you hang on, you know, you start growing this, it will turn into this in a few years. So it's a, it's a, a great plant. That was kind of cool. So those are just selections that they made of the species. Um, they found when they discovered the Echeverias in Mexico, they discovered that they were really easy to hybridize. And the French were the first to do that. And the first, first um, hybrid, hybrid of an Echeveria, which is amazing, is uh, Echeveria imbricata. And it is still available today. So this comes from 1870 and it is still for sale. I just bought this at Russell's the other day. So it is still available, it's still one of the best from 1870, so really old hybrid. They use this in California a lot for bedding out. If you're in San Diego, you see it's just used, they use this particular cultivar a lot. It's a great one. And you know, 1870, 150 years ago, and it's still going strong, so that's terrific. Um, then, of course, most of the hybridizing now happens in California, so there's lots and lots of California um, hybrids. and. Um, Actually, probably most of these are California hybrids. These are um, blue curls, blue waves, black prince, violet queen, afterglow, morning light. A lot of those are hybrids of this um, e um, Echeveria shaviana, which is, makes some really nice hybrids. They've done selections. This is one of my favorites. This one's a new one that just came out from California. It's called Neon Breakers. I didn't understand what the name meant until the end of the summer a couple of years ago. And it just, these, this color on the edge is a neon pink, and it's like waves breaking. It looks like breaking waves, and it's a gorgeous plant. It was done by Renee O'Connell out at Altman Plants, you know, the cactus collection. I don't know if you've ever bought from them online. She does a ton of hybridizing of the Crassulaceae, so this is a terrific plant. Actually, I actually have an extra one of those that I can add to the thing. I highly recommend it. It stays low, and it's just beautiful uh, when the light gets through those th this, that, that, that part there. Um, I think in Japan and uh, Korea as well, there are some people doing um, some um, hybridizing. Some of these are from there. Um, uh, like this one, I think, is one of the Korean ones. And this is Altman's. But th it's interesting. to go If you go on Etsy again, you'll see some of these ones that are coming from overseas. They're bringing them into the country. So they're, they look like they're going to be good. I, you know, they haven't been proven, but we'll see. Um, so um, some of the select. <laughs> so last year, I did. I did up what I thought was some great Echeveria. I'm sorry, it's way back here, but it's kind of heavy. Um, 
and again, you know, I had this in a greenhouse. All, it was in the, at Mass Hort, and there were new greenhouses all summer, and then it went into the greenhouse last winter. And during the winter, and I don't water things in there, I keep it as dry as possible so this doesn't happen, but they start to get these stems on them. And I don't like that. I like them to be nice and low, personally. I mean, I like, this is what, I like it to be like this, you know, nice and tight and low. But that's not the way those grow, obviously. They probably have some of the, um, clat, you know, some of the crosses. You've got one back there that's broken there, are Yeah. So I've got a lot of them here, so I'm going to, that's getting, you know, when I get home. So. Um, that was really annoying <laughs> when that started to happen. Uh, the other ones that are, uh, let's see, these are the hot, we just talked about these. This is probably a cross between um, Polydonis and Agavoides. It's called Tippy. It has little nice little tips. Um, uh, I let some of the flowers, I forgot to pull some, let's tip when you're growing these. When the flower petals fall off, if you're growing in the winter time and they fall down in there and you don't pull them out, they'll stay in the inside of the leaves and you just, you can't show the plant in a show, it's just a mess. So you have to keep your eyes peeled on those things sometimes, just a little tip. Uh, the crosses that are made most uh, are with uh, Grapta patellums, um, and I have a few of them here, that's Pacavaria. Uh, let's see, this, is this, uh, yes. So this is Graptivaria, so it's X Graptivaria. You'll see this one, this is called uh, Opalina. I like this one, this is a great one. Um, it's really hard to tell the crosses, differentiate them sometimes from Echeveria, and you often see them misnamed as Echeveria, but they're really crosses with the uh, Graptopatellums. So Graptivaria. Um, another one that you'll see a lot is Debbie. Have you seen Debbie? Debbie's beautiful. She's a really nice cross of those two species, just a lovely purpley, thick-leaved plant. Um, the other one that, that's crossed is with Pacophytons, um, Powder Puff. This is Powder Puff, and it looks very similar to that. It's hard to tell them apart sometimes. Here's a small Powder Puff. Usually Powder Puff will, starts to um, pop earlier than these guys, so you'll be able to tell it apart because it will start popping, and you'll have a cluster, more of a cluster than a single head. Um, and again, if you look at that website that I recommended, it has it all there, so you'll be able to figure out what everything is. Um, and then the other genus, uh, the other genus that's often crossed with uh, Echeverias are sedums, so Sedivaria, X Sedivaria, and these are some of those. Jet beads, I think, is a popular one. These are sort of great if you're doing a mixed container of Echeveria to put these in for a smaller, you know, to get them in mixed in with the bigger stuff to put them in for smaller. And they're always taller than they are wide. Um, some of them sort of fall off. Uh, I don't remember which one this one is, Alpine Glow or something like that. I think you, I'm sure you've seen that in nurseries. Uh, this is Sorrento. That's a newish one. So I don't, they have, this is a Dudleya. I don't think they've crossed Echeveria and Dudleya, so they mustn't be able to cross that. But uh, I don't know why I brought that, just to show you another one. This is a cross with, uh, this is a Graptopatellum uh, species, Philoferum. So you can tell why this would be, it would be hard to tell. If you cross this with one of the Echeveria, it would be really hard to tell that it was a cross. So another great, this is not a cross, but this is another really easy, great plant I'm very fond of, is Graptopatellum paraguayensis. Have you guys familiar with this plant? It's one of those great filler plants you can just stick in. I put it in all my pots, and it just goes off and does all these wonderful, long, branched things. And I just love it. I think it's a great plant um, and really, really easy to grow. So uh, let's see. So cultivation. Around here, obviously, we grow these in pots, and they like being in pots. You know, think of them growing in those outside the rocks and habitat. They're great in pots. Uh, when I grow them, I grow them in half perlite and half quality potting soil. So they need a really fast draining mix. Um, and some people, <coughs> I might, you might even do more perlite sometimes. Um, I do, these all go outside in the summertime, so they do stay pretty wet. Um, but they seem to be okay with that. But sometimes I do a little more perlite. Um, and I use perlite just because it's easy to, um, easy to, uh, to find it. Um, also, I just remind you all, you know, if you're mixing perlite and potting soil or any of that stuff, that you do it in a really well-ventilated area. I always have my mister and my hose going while I'm doing it so that the tamp's down. You don't want to ever be breathing that stuff. You know that, right? You all know that because that can cause lung cancer, so you want to be careful with that. Um, so they're in the sun at home, um, they, but they go into the shade, part shade in the afternoon when it's really hot. Um, just where I have them, is, it works out pretty well. I wouldn't put them in full sun all the time. Um, no frost, obviously. I wouldn't even do it with the agavoides, even though they say it can take it. Um, and again, good air circulation. And as the fall comes, all the colors of them get better and better and better. So. Um, 
it'll be, you get some, like my Romeo here will be bright red. So, so watering. Young plants um, obviously um, need more water than older plants. Um, and it also depends on whether you're growing them in a, um, excuse me, a clay pot or a plastic pot. So pots that are glazed or plastic, you don't need to water as much as if you have just an unglazed clay pot. You obviously know you need to water these more. They dry out a lot faster, okay? Um, and you often, uh, you repot the younger plants more, more frequently than the older plants. So this one's gonna sit here in this pot for a lot longer versus this guy, yes? In the pot that makes the and bearing in mind that they're in part sun, good amount, but part sun. So about how often do you water, just out of curiosity? Um, it, that's a good question. I, I sometimes water daily. If I check and see it's dried out, depends on if it's been a windy, hot day, okay. and it dry, the dries right out because it's in such a fast draining mixture. Um, obviously, it's been really cool the last couple of weeks. These have been out. At, I took them out of the greenhouse when last week, mm -hmm. so <laughs> they're all wet. Um, so I actually brought these in the house yesterday because I was a little concerned about them. So um, they'll be fine. But uh, yeah, so it depends on the temp nighttime temperatures too. If it's really warm at night, then I would water them more too. Um, but the best thing is if it rains. Rain is the best. Rain is so much better than, you know, hose water. So um, with all your plants, right? Um, let's see. Oh, overhead watering, again, in the wintertime, which you're not doing much watering of these in the wintertime, hopefully. Um, we'll get to that in a sec. But um, that you'll get spotting on the leaves. But as soon as they go outside again, rain on the leaves doesn't seem to spot them. I don't know why, but it's just nice and it's all that acid rain. I don't know what it is, but it, it seem, they seem to like it. Um, so uh, in winter, again, just very little water. So winter care, I bring them into a greenhouse. I'm very fortunate to have space in a greenhouse. Um, however, um, if you do, I have, as I said earlier, if you uh, have a good sunny spot, I mean, really south facing, you can definitely bring these in and have them in a sunny spot inside your house. Just don't water them. Let them just go dormant, okay? They can take it. If you start watering it, they start to etiolate and they start to look terrible and then you, you know, forced to do the, the beheading. Um, so definitely you want to um, really refer, try and refrain. And may I, as an example, a few years ago in the greenhouse I'm in, somebody's echeveria, I don't know, broke off. And that thing just sat there, the, this was in a greenhouse too, for eight months with no water, no roots, no in anything, just sat there and it was still alive. And that, I always remember that when I want to water over there. Stop. Think about that plant that didn't need it. There's enough moisture in the air. It was fine. It was dormant. So, you know, <clears throat> refrain from overwatering in the wintertime. Yes? So just to clarify, you said that they need bright light even if they're gone dormant? Yes. Because if they, yes, because they'll really suffer if they're not getting that, that light. Yep. So they really do. And I know that's hard, but I have, I've judged shows in February with some really amazing echeveria in it and uh, in Connecticut. And uh, they were all grown in a, you know, south-facing windows, but they were very careful with the watering or not watering. So, and they were really beautiful plants. So, yeah. So if you don't water in the winter, do they sometimes like shrivel? Yes. Like, yes. Do, and that's okay. It's okay. It comes back. Yeah, yeah, it'll come back. If you're really worried about it, you can give it a watering. But oh. what you don't want to do is have it start growing in the middle. You want it to really to wait, okay, until you're. To, until you're ready, you know. In March, I think you can start, the day length is coming, that, that's when you can probably start to water it more because the days are lengthening and they're getting enough light for that amount of water that you're gonna be giving it. Um, when you bring it back outside, just like us after the winter, don't, don't get a sunburn if you just bring it right outside. They get the same thing, or windy day, so be really careful. I did this, I got this from a California nursery, and usually I figure, well, they're growing it, you know, outside or under, you know, shade cloth or something like that. Well, the, I don't know where they were growing this, under a bench. But it's, uh, you know, it's got a big stain. I mean, this is gonna take a long time to look like a show plant, maybe never, because I got, it got a sunburn. So, not a good thing. So you gotta be careful when you bring them outside. Uh, it's normal for them to shed their bottom leaves. And I think, uh, let's see, I probably cleaned them all up, uh, most of them up here before I brought them here. Do I have any really bad ones? Uh, you know, I think you probably know what I'm talking about. They get these, you know, this happens with them. They do this all the time. So you want to um, make sure, I always take those off and I check because that's where the 
mealybugs like to hide, if you've got mealybugs. So you want to, that's a good thing to, and certainly if you're showing them in a show, you want to get rid of all of that before you show it. Um, these are not long-lived plants. They usually mature in two to three years at their full maturity, and then they start to decline. Although, my agavioides does last a lot longer. It's a nice plant. I like this plant. Very fond of it. It's great. But the rest of them, they'll start to decline. So they're, you know, they're sort of a treat. I mean, you're not gonna, they're not going to uh, last forever. Um, if you're repotting them, you want to repot them in the spring and summer. I mean, if you have to, you can do it in the fall. I mean, I often, you know, when you're moving things inside, I'll start propagating, which is not the best time to do it, but sometimes I do it, and they, they're pretty forgiving. Um, it flowers usually in late winter, so these started to bloom. This one was blooming in March in the greenhouse, so that was going strong. These have been lasting a long time. Um, hummingbirds, the ruby-throated hummingbird loves them. Of course, when you think of where the ruby throwing hummingbird goes in the wintertime, they go down to Mexico. So they like all their Mexican food when they get back north, sort of like cufias, if you grow cufias. I've, I've always got all these Mexican hummingbirds hanging around them, eating their cufias. So they love this. Um, so there's always hummingbirds hanging around, sometimes sitting in here, you know, and it's just great. Um, but sometimes they can get a lot of flower escapes and they can kind of look kind of messy. So um, it's up to you whether you want to keep the flower. Some people take them off all the time. They don't like the look of them. So it's up to you. Uh, let's see. Pests. Mealybugs and root mealybugs. I think you guys all know what they look like, right? I find the, um, I've had terrible luck with this one, Cinny, and I'm glad you don't. It looks like if this is really nice and clean, but I have had the worst luck with this. I've killed it many times. Uh, Gotten some others, but that not that one. So this is so lucky. Far. This is nice. Um, also, black prince and black knight, those two black leaved ones, always get mealybugs. I'll, you know, I'll say, this time I'm going to be, I don't know where they come from. I'll get clean. I, I take all the soil off, check, 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 and I always get mealybugs on them. So I just, I don't grow them anymore. They're nice and they're kind of fun sometimes if I have to do, but I, they always get mealybugs and then everybody else gets mealybugs. So um, that's just my, uh, and so what do you do if you get mealybugs? I usually do arts method with the uh, rubbing, what is it, uh, isopropyl alcohol and a Q-tip. So, and uh, I don't get scale, I've never gotten scale on these, but mealybugs and root mealybugs would be the one thing that you'd have to look for. Some of them never get it. Minima, I mean, some Shaviana, never, I never ever, for some reason they never go on them, but, but definitely that one and the, the darker colored ones. Um, blah, 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 blah. Oh, propagation. So um, you can either, you can opt, so you can get offsets, you can divide them. Like the ones that clump and move, you do this, so, so minima, Echeveria minima, very easy to propagate. You just take a piece off. I usually do, I have never been able to get, I, I think I've only tried with, with Strictiflora, that Texas one that I've been trying to grow and killed so many times. I tried to grow that from seed and had no luck with that either. So um, I have not been successful, unlike a lot of other succulents, with growing Echeveria from seed, but I can't say I've tried really hard either. They're very easy to vegetatively propagate. So you, so you can do division. Um, you can do offsets. Um, so if we have this guy coming, I'm trying to think if I have one I can just pull. Okay, here's an offset. Here we go. So this one's offsetting. These, this has big problems. So. Um, so this is getting an offset. So I could pull this off of here. Now let me get my clippers. Right, get dirt all over Law's floor here. I have to get the vacuum cleaner up. <laughs> so here's an offset. So some, some of them do this offset. They'll get these little pups, and it's already got roots coming out of it. So, um, but I would probably, you could if you wanted to, just, you know, then just, you'd let this callus over for a few days outside, and, and then you could stick it in some fresh new soil. Um, what I usually do is, um, what do they call it, deheading, I think is the word, the uh, correct word for it. I'm trying to, where is it, the lady said deheading. Uh, so I'd say beheading, but, um, so I, yeah, so our, which one do you have back there? Uniflora uh, corunculata. Yeah, oh, that's the corunculated ones. Yeah, see, I don't like those, oh my God. You want to show everybody what that looks like so people know what I'm talking about? There's one called raindrops that's actually okay, but it's very expensive and I always kill it, so I. It's curious, it's like they have big warts. Yes, right they have warty. Yes, yeah. yeah. What you do too, right? When they start to get uh, leggy, like so, and they're leaning, so what you do is unceremoniously get a knife, cut it off, put this in a 
pot right next to it, and within two or three weeks, this is just about a week old. It gets <coughs> calloused. Oh, excuse me, just got popcorn in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, this will start growing uh, roots just on its own. Put it in a clay pot with no soil in it, and just the humidity in the air, at least in a greenhouse. Anyway, it'll start growing. But in the meantime, what's really cool is uh, I can pass this along. But there are little baby offsets starting in all of the uh, the different corners of the stem. Yeah. They get four or five plants. Yeah, there. there's some little ones in there too, having with that one. Yeah, and, and the, 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 it's very interesting with these, how far down you cut this. If you cut it too long, you don't want to be cutting the old part. You want to be cutting into the new part. And you can tell it the old part's woody, right? So you can see that that's a woody stem there. The new part is much greener and new. So that's where you want to be making your cut. And this is even a little long. I might cut this even shorter. I might, you know, take some more of these leaves off if I'm... If it's not, you know, it's not sitting straight for when it's going to go in the pot. Um, if you do this, um, if you do it like, say, like this, you'll get another head will grow and it will be, as Art says, rooted in no time. After you've, you always let it callous off. You can, you do it a couple of weeks. I usually just do it a few days. If it's outside, it calluses off pretty fast because all the air. But, um, and then I'm potting it up in fresh new potting soil, obviously. You're not sticking it back in the old one. You want nice, it's a good time to get new fresh potting soil, and then you're gonna get another one of these. It's just gonna be exactly like this. If you cut it up a little farther in here, you're gonna force it to send out these little, this, these little things. So if you're trying to propagate a lot of them, the higher up you do it, you're gonna get more pups. So if you, for some reason, you're having a plant sale and you wanna get a lot of something, you just cut it higher and it will send pups out. So you'll get, then take those off and pot and then you'll have a whole bunch of new plants. If you go even higher, almost to the pinching out point, you'll get a multi-headed echeveria, which I've experimented with with some of them. Um, I don't think I brought any of them. They're kind of weird looking, but they're fun. <laughs> I think I pinched out one of the agavioides once, and so you get two heads or three heads growing from one thing, which is just kind of a fun thing you can do. Um, but on the whole, just like that, uh, depending on what you need, usually you just want another one of the same one. Yep. So when you put it that low, that the all the bottom leaves are going to be sitting on top of the soil, right? Yeah. No, you know what I would do? I'd probably do it in um, a pot like this. So it would be resting on there. So it would be like that. And then it would be just resting in there. And it would be, I have the soil up there pretty high. Tap, tap, tap. Um, I don't think I'll, I'll mess it up here. But um, yeah, and you can just, and it will be fine. So, you know, definitely you pot, you're going to fiddle around with the pots till you get the right one to, to you know, make it work. But uh, yeah, so that is. Yeah, minimal water, and I'd be doing it like this time of year or next month, probably June, where it's warmer, and you know, just my regular watering would be enough. But yeah, because it would, it probably if I if I didn't even put it in there, just like Art says, he puts it in a clay pot and just the moisture starts roots out. I usually do it right in here. I've had luck, good luck with that, because I'd probably forget to put soil around it, <laughs> and I'd wonder why it was dead, and then I'm like, oh, it doesn't have any soil around it. <laughs> So, anyways, so I do it right away. Yes. I was just going to add on the nodulosa that there were branches coming out of the top which were really ugly. So I cut them off and I put them in a clot, peeled them down, cut it short, put them in a glass dish and forgot about it for three weeks or so. That's our rooting. They were all rooted. Yeah. They had roots going out. Yeah. So I just potted them up yeah. to bring in. Yeah, no, they're, uh, they're very forgiving plants. So uh, you just do whatever works for you. As I said, I'd forget to put soil in it, so I always just do that because it's... Um, and, you know, when you're uh, propagating also, you just want to make sure, do the labels. Get, Art talked about good labels the other day from the Venetian blinds, but um, definitely do your labels. I always write the name, the date. I, I, well, I always put where I got the plant from at the top on the back. I always say where I got it from. Um, you know, whether it came from Art or I got it from Arid Lands or wherever I got it from, Miles to Go, I put that on there. If I got it at Home Depot, I put that on there. And then, um, you know, cut and the date and repot. You know, I always keep that information. If you're entering a flower show and you're in a propagation class, you need to have that information anyway. But it's just interesting to, to check on, oh, yeah, I did this last year. I did this two years ago. And if you're, you know, that's just good practice when you're propagating. So always remember to do that. And I'm always mad at myself when I forget to do it. And I look, where did I get that? And I haven't written it down. Um, 
the other thing is um, if you're showing these in a show, um, there are, you can do, there are all sorts of options. Um, a lot of them, you can see I have a lot of them in, in plastic pots. They do very well in plastic pots. But you know, if I were going to put this in the Boston show, I wouldn't show it in a plastic pot probably. I'd dress it up a little bit. And um, you know, clay pots, terracotta, obviously. Um, I think my, one of my sisters made this. She's a potter, so sometimes uh, glazed pots can be tricky, but Echeverry are pretty good in them. I would not do the, this is glazed on the inside as well, you see, and that can be tricky with some other succulent plants, so watch that. But, you know, if I had um, like this particular one, it might look pretty fun. The people in California do all kinds of fun pots and top dressing and all kinds of stuff. We're very staid here in, in um, New England, but. This blue with this is kind of nice, and this will turn a pinker color. And I, I might do it in something like that, and put it, you know, if it's going on a terrace, on a table out in the terrace. I, I kind of like that, so I might do that. So, um, but it might not be something that's allowed in a flower show. So you want to keep that. This is, um, oh, I think this is, this is that great guy that sells at uh, New England Bonsai. He has a, um, what's his name, Paul, Paul something, Olson. Paul Olson. Who's? Oh. God, if you guys have a chance, has he, have you, he spoken to you or sold at your shows or anything? He does the best pots. I love, I have a lot of his pots. This is one of his pots. Yeah, great. I was going to say that it looks like his pots. Yeah, they're fantastic yeah. pots. Um, he, he's down in um, Pawtucket, our Providence, Rhode Island. He teaches at RISD and he has this great Clam Alley pottery and he does, uh, he does a lot of bonsai pots, but he also does them for succulents. He grows succulents and just really terrific. If you want to, I mean, I just think this, personally, I think this looks really nice. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that's me. But he's a really good potter and, uh, and not, not uh, too expensive. I think his pots are very well priced. Actually, they're probably underpriced compared to some of the other ones I've seen. So he's great. So New you can find him at New England Bonsai, but you can also go online and find him. He sells an Etsy. And when I first saw him on Etsy, I'm looking, you know, I was ordering, I was going to order stuff. And the shipping cost was terrible. And I'm like, where does he live? Oh, he's in Rhode Island. I'm going to contact him and see if I can just drive down. And I did. I've yeah. been down a few times and bought pots from him. He's fantastic. Yeah, if you've ever heard of one, so you can just contact him. Yeah, very nice man. And uh, if you're doing something for an exhibit, I did something at the New England Spring Flower Show years ago. A contain uh, actually, the Rechevere is a collection class, and they were all in his pots. And he and his wife came up to see it, won a big award, and it was fun. So he's really great. Um, What's you know, his name? Paul Olson. And it's Clay Alley Pots, is that? Yeah. Clam Alley, that's right, it's right down by Clam Alley Pots. O-L-S-E-N? Uh, O-L-S-E-N, yep. 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 Thank you. Fantastic potter. And just, he gets the succulent thing, so he really does grow. And, you know, usually they're not glazed on the inside. My sister doesn't get that, but my, he does, so it's, they're really good. <laughs> but they're free for my sister, so that's good. Um, so um, let's see, and I'm just going to wrap up here. What I do want to last say, the last thing I want to say to you guys is please, please, please exhibit. Bo the Boston Show and at Newport, the horticulture exhibits have been way, way down the last few years, and it's really sad. There are some cactus, Massachusetts cactus and succulent people who are big exhibitors at that shows, and we're eternally grateful. But please, you know, dip your toe. If you never exhibited, dip your toe in the water. Call the, those of us that work on these shows. We need, you know, the public loves these shows. This is a great, they're big, you know, they get t tens of thousands of people seeing these shows and they need exhibits. And you guys are all growing some incredible plants. I know it's sometimes a pain in the neck to go pick them up at the end. Newport is easy though. I mean, really, it's beautiful. It's not that far away. It's a beautiful show, but it was just sad last year to see how few exhibits there were in horticulture. So, right, Donna? Yeah, we need to get you guys to, we need to get you guys to exhibit, so please consider that. And um, I think that's it. Does anyone have any? Yes, Jean. Fertilizer. Fertilizer. I use a slow release that's in the potting mix. I uh, the potting mix that. So I use a good quality potting mix for half. Um, I think it's Jolly Gardeners. I used to do Faffords. I used to get big giant bags of Faffords, but I can't find it anymore. So I get Jolly Gardener, and it's got slow release fertilizer in it. And I, you know, I'm repotting these every second year, so that seems to work fine. So. Yep. What about uh, it gets down pretty cold and it's it, uh, just 40s. Yeah. They can take it down 40 oh, yeah. No problem. And, you know, especially if you don't want them 40 and wet. So that's why I'm right. saying keep them dry in the wintertime. They're just sitting there. Yes, they can take 40 very easily. They actually like it. Think of them growing in those high elevations, what it's like 
the temperatures at night and those high elevations. So yeah, it's cold, right? Not snowing, but it's cold. So indoor heat, um, you know, that's that's hard. If you were putting in a sunny window and you have your, t I mean, my house is really in the 60s in the winter. We have a 60 set at 62, so it's cold, I guess, for some people. If you've got it at 80, then you, you, they might have a problem. But think about turning your, you know, buying some fleece and wool and turning your thermostat down. So yes. No. You mean decline, you just don't like the way it looks decline. Um, that's a very good question. They're not on a carpet, so they're not going to die after they. Um, but let me say, okay, here's Lola. Lola's a lovely little thing. But this poor Lola has been beheaded or deheaded. I've lost track of them, I mean, 10 times. She's starting to decline. I mean, she's not her, the way she used to be. She's just. <laughs> She's been, oh, here's one of Paul's pots, though. Isn't that a nice pot? That's one of Paul's clam alley pots again. I mean, so I have to put it, I think this Lola is about to, you know, when, when I propagate this one, I think what I'm going to do is what I said before. I'm going to cut it really up there so I can get some of those little ones to come out so I can get some new ones, new fresh new ones. If you keep lopping the head off, they do start to decline. No, I mean, I guess if you didn't know anybody, you'd say this looks good, but I know. I, I just am like, oh, poor Lola. She's been, you know, I've chopped her body off, her roots off so many times. <laughs> but again, Paul's pot, isn't that beautiful? Just a lovely little pot. So yeah, so that's, that's what I mean. If you're, doing the, if you're doing divisions or you're doing those little pups that come off, those are nice new plants and that's fine. But the, when you keep c continually cutting the head off, every two years, they start to decline. You'll notice a decline, so. Yeah, I was looking at poor Lola. Oh. But she is a beautiful thing, so. Anyways, she's almost ready for the compost heap. So, any other questions yet, Carol? Yes, so Carrie, um, do you, when you put yours outside in, in the summer, do you put them, like, outside in the sun, or do you put them in a tables? Oh, good question. I'm glad you brought that up. I forgot to mention the number one pest outside. Guess who? Chipmunks. Yeah. My God, I went out this morning, and he's been eating. So I have mine on, um, although he can still get up on them, but not as easily, on r racks outside, black wire racks. I mean, if you just put them on a low table or on the ground, the chipmunk will eat them. The only, the only succulents I can keep outside in the summer are agaves, which will, of course, stab them to death, and cacti, and some of the really little seedlings that they don't seem to like. If I put out anything else, they eat them. And they'll climb up on the table and eat. So I don't grow echeverias because it's depressing. They don't eat. I mean, I, they, it's, it's interesting. They're, most of the, sometimes they take a nibble, and their leaves grow pretty fast. So it's not a big deal. It's not like if they took a nibble out of something that only has four leaves, and it took forever for to do that. So these, you know, you can, if they jump in the middle and eat it, then it's, they're goners. But, um, you know, if, it's, it's not that big a problem because I've been doing this for years and it's, I wouldn't call, I mean, they're really annoying. Uh, mostly they're digging and I think they're stashing stuff in them so I'll find, you know, knocked over and things like that. But yeah, I don't if, know what to, uh, yeah. If one takes a trip to Milford, they sell dry ice there. And <gasps> Ooh. If you drop dry ice down the chipmunk holes and put bricks all the most of them. It's, it's painless, it's humane, <laughs> right? And your problem is gone. They will no longer mock you. No, I am. I've, I've got a couple right now that are driving me mad. That's what you need to do. Yeah. Chipper Dipper, you heard the Chipper Dipper? I haven't done anything yet, though. So. Yes. I found a really great solution to Chipper Dipper's world. What's that? Oh, barred owls? Yeah, bar we have barred owls, but they can't keep up with our chipmunk. Uh, he just is really something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I would say I would not use that as an excuse not to grow these. I mean, obviously, I grow a lot of these. You know, they're fine. So, you know, this morning, I did notice he was eating one of them. He ate a sedum. Um, what is it, California Sunset, which is a really pretty one, and it was, doesn't look too good right now. <laughs> so... Um, so any other questions? Yes, Jean? Yeah, um, sorry. You mentioned miles to go on average. Do you have any other places that oh. are good to buy from? Yeah, so uh, let's see. Um, 
The succulent source is a cute little micro nursery out in um, California, does a big wedding thing. They have a lot of them. But again, go on Etsy and just type into the Echeveria. And yeah, and they sent, I get things in just a couple of days. So I got a few of these just because I was doing this. I bought a few more and I got them in three days. And, the, and the, it wasn't as expensive as it used to be to send things from California. So I was, I was mildly happy, yes. Could you talk about propagating from leaves? Oh, yes. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, you c some of these you can, and some of th these you can't. And actually, you know what? I'm take that back. <coughs> Here's a Shaviana here. So you, you can propagate the grapt petalums and the um, grap and the, um, uh, what's, uh, anyways, the uh, oh, pack of, pack of items from, from any of their leaves. You can drop, take off one of these leaves, lay it down, and it will get a new plant. You know, you're familiar with that. Most of the echeverias do not do that. At least for me, they don't. So if you want to do that from a, from a leaf, if you want to take a leaf cutting, you take it from these flowering stems. And when you do is you cut off part of the stem. So if I were going to um, cut this, I'd be taking a really sharp knife or razor blade. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot about that. And I would cut into this flowering stalk here and the leaf, and that would get a new plant from the Echeveria. But most of them, there's a few of them, Diphractans, Echeveria Diphractans, every leaf will make a new little plant, but most of them do not, um, unlike their cousins there. But you can do it from these flowering stalks. So definitely you wanna try that. If you wanted some more of these, you just reach in there with a nice sharp knife and take a little bit of the stalk of the flowering stalk, and then this whole leaf. And um, again, I'd do a pot of potting, my mix, and I'd just lay, because I'd forget if I left those, they'd blow away. So I'd put them right on that, and they'll root. They'll start rooting in a couple of weeks. So you can definitely do leaf cutting. So thank you for, thank you for asking that question. But it has to be from a flowering stalk uh, of most of them, like, except for diphractans, I think, is the only one that will do it from, from a leaf down in the body of the plant. Any other ones? Yeah. Yeah, have you done much with, like, Ah, variegated ones. Um, I'm trying to remember if I've ever grown one of them. Donna, you had one, didn't you? A variegated echeveria? Yeah. They're, they're not, they're weak. <coughs> yeah, they're weak growers, I think, so I haven't. Um, so um, I know they're really cool, um, but I have not. I mean, I've, as I've gotten older and grown so many of them, I go to my old favorites because I know they're going to do a good job and look nice. Shavianas. Agavoides, uh, Minima, you know, any, or the crosses with those. But no, I haven't. They're just, I, I've watched yours, Donna, and thought, those are kind of weak plants, I think. So, yeah. No, not because of you, you, the way you're growing them. I'm <laughs> She's a friend of mine, so I know. We're in the same greenhouse, so I know. <laughs> so I'm like, that's not, that's not a great plant. <laughs> so, yes, Har? I just mentioned how I didn't like them. <laughs> So, sorry. <laughs> no, you know, there's one, there's one pretty one, I think, called Raindrops. And it, um, Logi sells it and for $25 a plant. It's just, just ridiculous, I think. But anyways, until I try to grow it. It has, uh, on, the, uh, mature, on the immature leaves or the mature, I can't remember which, it gets just a, a perfect circle, like a raindrop, which is kind of cool. But, oh my God, that was so hard to grow. I could not, I tried a few times. I maybe spent $100 trying to grow that plant and I just said, I give up, boy, yeah. So this, is, this one that you've been able to, you've had no problem with, obviously. So I just don't like the look of them, so I don't grow them. And some of them are really, you know, but it's a personal thing. Yeah, so. Yeah, I'm sure he did. Yeah, I, I, you know, maybe guys like them more than gals. I don't, I don't know what it is. I just don't like them. So I don't, I, don't, I tried raindrops and I killed it many times. Yes. How do you feel about some of the crested forms? Uh, the, you mean like, uh, yes. So um, crest, the crested ones. Um, I have, I have a couple of the crosses that are crested. And they're fine, but you do have to watch them really carefully for mealybugs because they get in. For some reason, those crested ones, I always got mealybugs. I don't mind them. They're, they're okay. It depends, you know. Um, it's just, you know, they're just kind of weird looking mutations. Uh, no, 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 it's just a looks thing. Um, no, I don't find them more difficult except for just keeping my eyes on the bugs. So, because they, for some reason, they, 
they, they're more congested, the leaves get more congested, so you have to keep looking for all the mealybugs down inside them, so. Yeah, as you look, the leaves get broken Yeah, and they all just break off. I'm like, why am I growing this thing? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's kind of ugly. So, anyways, yeah, yeah? So, in your southern-facing windowsill, you can, you know, just keep turning? Keep turning it during the winter time and keep the water down to a dull roar. So, yeah, I'd wait, and then, you know, March, you can start watering so again. Maybe if you can make yourself not water once a month, just or maybe every two months if you can't bear to. It depends on the mix you're in. If you've got, so if you bought them, yeah. Sometimes you buy them and they're in this. Um, here's one that I bought, and it's, you know, it's in like really. It's you know, this gets wet. This is a lot of. There's not enough drainage in here, so this one. It depends. If you repotted them in a really sharp draining, you might water them more. But if you're just buying them and growing them the way they came from the nursery. You really don't need to water this thing until March, so it will be alive still. This is one of the ones I was going to chop off, but we've got enough chopping off that we've done because this is very unattractive. You can see how that's started to grow like that. That's not good. So that would be one that we, I'd cut off right here and start it again. Let it callus off for a week or so and then start it again. And I think this is Pearl von Nuremberg, which is a German hybrid from the early part of the 1900s. So, so that's good Yes, so this was, this was at Valente Farms in Needham. I rescued it from there. They had it inside the grocery store sitting there and it was getting water. And I'm like, ah, I can do the demo on how to not to grow these things. So yeah, but this can, you know, I'll, be, I'll cut this and just and, you know, start it again and it will be a nice plant, so. But yeah, this was too much water, not enough light in the wintertime, this is what happens. So this is not good, right? Yeah. Can you overwinter under lights? Uh, yeah, but they do, they, uh, yes, but the, a sunny window would be better, a south-facing window. But if you change your light bulbs regularly, you could probably do it fine. And you had them up really close, just like Paul was talking about the Worthias too, the closer they are, you'd probably, be, and you didn't water them, they'd be fine. Yep. Yeah, you guys know you have to change your light bulbs regularly, right, on your grow lights. Everybody knows that, right? Yes. Okay. Is that it? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> All right. <laughs>